Would you please bow your heads with me for a moment of prayer? Heavenly Father, Almighty God, you gather us here in your house today as your dearly beloved children. Lord, from various backgrounds and languages and peoples, you have gathered us together through the waters of baptism. You have joined us together in your Son, Jesus, our Savior. And it is here that you continue to minister to us with your word, with his very body and blood. Remind us of that forgiveness, of that life, of that hope that we have in him. So Lord, as we are gathered together as a family of you, might you speak to our hearts and to our minds. Equip us to see the world as you see it. Enable us to love others and forgive others as you love and forgive us. And equip us, Lord, each day to see all people of this world as those who you love and care for above all else. I ask now, Lord, be the words of my mouth and the meditations of all the hearts that are gathered here together that we might be and abide in your presence. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be unto all of you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a story that once the Duke of Wellington came to church and he knelt at the communion rail. And shortly after that, a, an elderly poor beggar came and knelt at the communion rail right next to him. Well, the church official saw that. He knew that shouldn't be the case. So he went over and he tapped the old elderly poor man on the shoulder. And he encouraged him to move and give some space to the nobleman. Well, the elderly man began to move and get up. And at that moment, the Duke of Wellington reached out his hand and grabbed the man. He said, don't move. We are all equals here. You see, it's those words of the Duke of Wellington that embody the lesson for God's text for us today. That we are all equal here. You see, here in God's house, the beggar and the nobleman are equals. Both are sinners, and both need forgiveness. And it's only through faith in Jesus Christ that they both receive that same gift, full and unconditional forgiveness from God. Now, of course, things in this world are quite different. The CEO is given more honor than the employee. The wealthy are regarded much higher than the middle class. The athlete is given much more respect than just a normal person. And the celebrity is exalted above her adoring fans. But God doesn't play favorites. We all stand before God as equals in two ways. First, by the law. We all stand before God as sinners, deserving eternal damnation. But secondly, by the gospel, God declares all believers not guilty of those sins. So all believers stand before God on an equal plane, equal in Christ Jesus. Or this is how Paul puts it. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now I gotta say, that is a pretty amazing statement. Because, well, all people, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their social status, regardless of their gender, stand before God on equal footing. All believers are one in Christ. And notice the couplings that Paul uses here. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means in the New Testament age, all nations, all nations are included in God's salvation promise. You see, salvation is no longer just a Jewish thing. But Paul uses that word Greek to denote non-Jews. We call them Gentiles. Now, in the Old Testament, this would not have been the case. Because the Jews were descendants of Abraham. They were God's chosen people. The promise of the Messiah was given to the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the promise of salvation was to the Jews. And therefore, all those who were non-Jews, we call them the goyim, the unclean. Well, they were left out. But now Paul says that that old Jewish-Gentile distinction doesn't ever apply. 
He says, regardless of your language, regardless of your nationality, regardless of your ethnicity, everyone, every single person is on an equal standing before God, which means no one is excluded and no one is favored. However, though, all that we're on the same plane before God, that doesn't mean that God mandates equality in earthly matters. You see, it's true that people stand before God as equals, but the Lord doesn't demand equality in man's relationship to man. God doesn't demand equality in temporal matters or, like, say, in social matters, not in the workplace, not in human governing, not in sexuality, not in religiosity, not anywhere in the human realm. Now, today, people are trying to impose their views upon the government. And they say, well, this is what God intended. I'm here to tell you that's not the case. Which brings us to Paul's second coupling. There is neither slave nor free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, in the first century, there were many, many, many slaves in the Roman Empire. But unlike slavery in the modern world, it wasn't based upon race. Slaves look very much like their masters. And I think that's why many are surprised to find out that the Bible doesn't condemn slavery. Actually, Paul goes on to say this. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this will receive back from the Lord, and not, and whether he is a bondservant or is free. Now, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening. Know that he is who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So what Paul is saying is he's encouraging Christian masters and Christian slaves to treat each other well, for they will one day stand before the Lord and give an account for how they treated one another. So there is neither slave nor free. Paul's emphasis here is this, that the condition of the free man does not give him any advantages in regards to salvation. And the condition of the slave does not exclude him from God's promises of heaven. See, both receive that same forgiveness and eternal life without regard to their position in society. Then Paul takes up the issue of gender. And please don't let the language of our world today confuse this. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let me just say, there are only two genders that were created and established by God. And Paul's point again is to say that before God, in matters of salvation, both genders share equally in his promises. Therefore, the man or the woman who believes that he or she is saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, by the merits of Jesus Christ alone, is a son of God. You see, when it comes to the most important issue of life, our relationship with God, both genders are on the same level. God doesn't favor one over the other, but that's not what we hear in our world. You see, ever since the 1960s, something has arisen within American culture that many have referred to as modern American feminist movement. It took seed, it blossomed, and it's bloomed and flourished across our nation. And it's impacted all aspects of our institutions, including the church. So that by 1995, Christianity was labeled as a purely male-dominated theology. Now, the reaction to that is for many mainline Protestant denominations to start to ordain women, despite what the scriptures teach. For example, if anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. You see, American feminism, though, responds to that text by quoting our text today. There is no male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. 
They reasoned, well, humanity is no longer two genders, but one human race. So the ordination of a woman is really the ordination of the human race. Thus, women were ordained, and the thrust of God's word was lost. That all people stand before him as equals when it comes to salvation. You see, Galatians 3.28 doesn't apply to civil or to social or political or even ecclesiastical distinctions. It applies only to our status before God. These earthly distinctions, well, they should be maintained to keep proper order in the family, in the church, in our community, in our state, even in our country. So you got to think, would the church ever learn from this embarrassment? Well, sadly, no. Unfortunately, the debate among Christians about LGBTIQ and transgender issues all stems from a re- misrepresenting God's word. And so today, liberal churches suggest that we need to get rid of all male-female distinctions since we're all just one human race. How confusing have we become? Well, understand that our gender equality before God is not meant to translate into some genderless human race here on earth. So you see, the world has a way of really conforming how we hear and see God, our relationship with him, and others' relationship with him. So getting back to Paul's original point, that regardless of our nationality, our social status, or even our gender, all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus are all sons of God. We are one body in Christ because we believe and have been baptized into his name. And that means that we will keep our gender distinctions until that last day when God welcomes us all of us, into his heavenly kingdom. So know this today, you are a son of God. And because you are a son, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are an heir through God. Now today is Father's Day. Tim did a wonderful way to remind us, this is the day we give thanks for all the the men in our lives who have modeled for us that Christian faith and love and forgiveness. But more so today, we should be thankful to our Heavenly Father who delivered His Son over to death so that you and I would have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.